Hello, everyone, and welcome to Chapter 8. This is our first dive into inferential statistics, and it happens to be with one of my favorite topics, which is confidence intervals. And just like in Chapter 7, uh, when we explored the sampling distribution for sample means and sample proportions, in confidence intervals, we will be doing things with means and proportions. So a lot of the same stuff that you've seen in Chapter 7 is going to make a return here. Um, I again want to cite that uh, a number of our problems and some of the images uh, all or in part are coming from our um, textbook, uh, which is the publisher Hawks Learning Systems. Okay, so our objectives uh, with these two sections that we cover from chapter eight um, are to first define some rather important terms that are related to confidence intervals. Uh, explain the implications of changing the sample size and or level of confidence on a confidence interval. Um, compute using a given point estimate, a confidence interval for a population mean and population proportion. And of course, being able to compute the minimum sample size for a situation that involves a population mean or a population proportion. So a lot of the things that we do here with means, we're going to repeat with proportions. So lots of computations. All right, so again, this is our first dive into inferential statistics, and it begins with the idea of a confidence interval. And so really, what is the motivation? Why do we care? What's the point of all of this? Well, the problem is that often in research, the populations that we're studying are very, very large. They're complex. Perhaps the population is spread, over, spread out over a very large geographical area. It's just too hard to get to everyone in the population. And as a result, um, we just don't know what the parameters are, right? Parameters, remember, are those numerical characteristics that describe our population. So the idea is, well, what do you do if you don't know the parameter or if you don't know anything? And the answer to that is, we guess, okay? Now, it can't just be a random guess, all right? So in other words, uh, we have a dartboard and we just throw the dart and whatever number it lands on, that's what we're going to use. No, no, no. Um, it's got to make sense for the data that we're looking at. And so what we have to do then is take a sample. And if you remember, the sample is what we can literally put our hands on, right? So if I collect a sample, I can extract data from my sample, whether uh, it's a, a group of individuals or uh, some other sort of objects or uh, data points that I may be pulling from a spreadsheet or database. Um, and I can do things then with my sample statistics. So the idea then is that we take the sample, we have our statistics in our hand, uh, and then what we do is we infer what the parameter could be. Therefore, we have this idea of inferential statistics. Now, there is certainly a chance that when we make our inference, um, we could be wrong, okay? And so what we do to sort of accommodate or give ourselves a little bit of leeway is we actually give a range of values that we think the parameter is going to live between. And what we assign to that interval is a level of confidence. And you can think of the level of confidence almost as a probability. So somebody might say, I'm 90% confident that the final exam average is going to be between 80 and 90. What this means is that, um, one, they're 90% confidence, but there's a 90% chance that they're right, that the actual average uh, score on the final exam is going to be between 80 and 90. Now, you might also say, well, is there a 10% chance they're wrong? And the answer to that would be yes. Okay, so there is, again, uh, some risk to this. And so the idea then is that the confidence interval is born. Now we have some vocabulary um, that goes with us and I'm putting it all on the screen now so that you can see it. Um, there, there's one in particular that you're gonna need to be able to uh, define, uh, especially on uh, an exam. And that's the first one. And that's with a point estimate. So a point estimate is a single number estimate of a population parameter. So point estimates take the form of sample statistics. Okay, so um, if, if I'm trying to predict that final exam score, um, for, for my population, and let's say I use our section as the sample, and I decide to, um, I don't know, use an average of 82, okay, that 82 that's coming from my section of stats 1020 uh, would be considered a point estimate, and that's what I'm using then to sort of predict or infer about the population parameter, and so point estimates can change depending on the sample, okay, so there's lots of variation with that. 
Now it says the best sample statistic is something that is an unbiased sample statistic. And we'll talk about what that means in a moment. You might have an inclination if you remember what bias uh, actually means. Um, we have something called an interval estimate. Um, this is an actual range of possible values for the parameter, okay? And we also have a confidence level. Um, this is the probability that our interval estimate actually contains the parameter, so usually represented as a percentage. And when we combine the interval estimate and the confidence level, we get something called a confidence interval. So that's an interval estimate that has a certain level of confidence with it, okay, and that's denoted as C. So there is a difference between the interval estimate and the confidence interval. The interval estimate is literally just a range of values. Somebody asks you, hey, what do you think the exam scores are going to be between uh, for the average? And somebody will say, yeah, 80 to 90, okay, and somebody else might say, well, I'm 90% sure that um, the average is going to be between 80 and 90. So just saying 80 and 90 is the interval estimate, assigning then a percentage to it uh, would make it a confidence interval. So let's see if we can use the vocabulary. This way you have uh, something on the screen you can look at. Um, so let's again return to this idea of final exam scores. But this time I want to try to estimate what the true average or mean final exam score is for all sections of elementary statistics courses offered in Michigan. So at all uh, universities and colleges. So what I decide to use um, are three of my sections average final exam score from a prior fall term, okay, to base my guess on what we call the true average. Now you're gonna see that vocabulary, true average, that means the parameter. So anytime somebody says true average, true proportion, they're referencing the parameter, okay? Now the average score was 73.3, okay? This would be my point estimate, okay? Because it's coming from a sample that I have taken, namely my three sections. Now the question is whether or not this point estimate is biased or unbiased. And if you remember on the previous slide, I said that we wanna be able to take an unbiased estimate. So we're gonna to return to this question in a moment. Now to not limit myself to this specific number, um, I decide to say that I believe that the true mean final exam score is gonna be between 70.3 and 76.3. So this is what I declare as my interval estimate. So you'll notice I didn't say how sure I am, how confident, what my probability is. I'm just saying what the range of the average is going to be. Okay, well, a colleague of mine says, you know, there's something going on with your point estimate. Um, and they're arguing that it's not representative since my sections have a tendency to perform better on the final exam. So instead, I used the average final exam score from all 13 sections at Wayne State that took the final in a previous fall term, and this average was 70.1%. So one could argue that this is still a point estimate, that, that's for sure, it's coming from a sample, but one could argue that this is also unbiased now, okay? So previously, I was only using my sections, and someone said, well, you know, there's something up with your sections. You, you tapped, your sections tend to do a little bit better. That's not necessarily representative. So my previous point estimate um, may have been biased. So a little bit better of a representative sample is to take all 13 sections that we had operating here at Wayne State in a previous fall term. And actually that might be a little bit better because the sample size is larger, thereby reducing the variation. So this then would be sort of an unbiased estimate. Now, what I decide to do is revise my interval estimate now that I have a new point estimate to use, and you'll notice it's now 68.1 to 72.1, okay? Um, you might say, well, well, why did you have to change it? Well, remember, because the point estimate has changed, this also changes the interval estimate. So uh, this does happen, right? If we take different samples, you're going to get different interval estimates, no big deal. Now, a colleague asks me how sure I am uh, that my interval estimate is, is true. In other words, it's going to capture that true average final exam score for all the sections. And I say I'm 90% sure that my interval is correct. In other words, that it's going to contain that average final exam score. So what I have just done is I have assigned a level of confidence, right, that 90%. And me saying that the 68.1 to 72.1, this is now a confidence interval because I have assigned it a level of confidence. So it went from an interval estimate, just a range of values, now to having some probability behind it. So I hope this example illustrates um, the use of that vocabulary. Um, and you kind of see the idea between a biased and unbiased point estimate. 
All right, so some examples um, to just get us used to some of the more of the vocabulary. Um, I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to pause the video and make sure that you read this question. All right, so the question here we're being asked is what is the sample proportion um, and what is the parameter? So we have to remember our vocabulary, namely our variables that represent these things. So a sample proportion is given by key hat. And what we're looking for here is the proportion of people who, who own a cat, okay? And so in this case, 50 of the individuals surveyed said they did out of the 200. Um, and so you can simplify that if you would like. Now, the question is, what is the parameter here? Now, we have a bit of a problem, and that is that we don't know it as a number, okay? We don't know how many people necessarily are even in the population uh, for cat ownership. I'm not sure if that's ever been captured. So what you do is just like in chapter one, um, we have to express it in words. So in this case, uh, the population proportion P would be the proportion of adults who own a cat. And you'll notice that that follows um, what the sample proportion looked like. And sample proportion, of course, was a fraction, and it was a fraction of people um, who own a cat. All right, so once again, please take a moment, uh, pause the video and give this a read. All right, we have some follow-up questions here. Um, this question is asking whether or not um, it deals with means or proportions and how exactly do we know? So what do you think, okay? Uh, well, if you read it carefully, it actually uses the word proportion and we have another clue and that is percentages are floating around in here, right? So it says Gallup reports that there are, they are 75% confident that the proportion Okay, so it's a it's an immediate giveaway. So you do have to make sure you're reading carefully to know if we're dealing with means or proportions. Now the sample statistic here, or the point estimate, is what? So what exactly are they um, are they using here to sort of dictate what they think is is um, or what the, the value rather that they're using to infer about the population? Uh, and that would be the 35% um, who vote for the Democratic candidate because it says they randomly sample a thousand American voters and find 35% of them will vote for the Democratic candidate. So that is coming from very clearly the statistic. This should sound familiar because you've had problems like this in chapter one, right, where you've had to pull out what the statistic is. So if you're having some issues with that, I would encourage you to return to two chapter one. Okay, so what was the confidence interval here? So what exactly were we looking at? What was the range they gave us? Okay, well, that was the 30% to 40%. Okay, and what level of confidence did they assign to this? Uh, again, it said Gallup reports, they are 75% confident. Now, we have something called um, an interpretation of the confidence level and the confidence interval. So in other words, how do we interpret what 75% means and how do we interpret what the interval, 30 to 40%, is actually saying? Um, so this one would say we are 75% confident that the true proportion of American voters who will vote for the Democratic candidate is between 30 and 40%. This is known as a confidence statement. And what this does is it interprets the confidence interval. So it explains what we mean by 75% confident and 30% to 40%, okay? So that's explaining this. We are 75% confident that the true proportion of American voters who will vote for the Democratic candidate is between 30 and 40%. Okay, so again, that is a confidence statement. This is something you will need to be able to write uh, in the future. So very important that you know how to do this. And we will talk a bit more um, in class. Okay, this is a rather complicated drawing. What I would encourage you to do is to pause the video and just think about what this is trying to show. What do you notice? What are some, some observations that you have? All right, so if you look carefully at this image, um, there are a couple of things that kind of point out. Um, first of all, um, I think the part of the image got cut off. Um, there are 100 of these little bars, okay? So there are 100 of those. Hopefully you didn't have to count them all. I'm not sure why the image is, is so large when I had it on the um, other version of the PowerPoint, uh, you could at least see what the, the header was. So uh, there are 100 of these, and you should notice that there are five that are highlighted in red, okay? And there's a there's a line that extends through the middle of this sea of lines, okay? This sort of pink line, red line, maroon, whatever color you want to call it, that's running horizontally across the page, 
is representative of the parameter, okay? So again, the parameters representing the population. And if you notice very carefully, we have five of these bars that are either above or below, specifically four are below, one is above. So that would infer that not five of them are, are not containing the parameter and 95 are. So what that means is you're actually looking at a 95% confidence interval here, okay? So what it means, 95%, is that if we take 100 samples, we would expect 95 of those samples that we build intervals around are going to contain the parameter. And if you look at each of these bars separately, you'll notice that there's a green dot in the middle. Those green dots stand for the point estimate, okay? So we, we build a confidence interval around our point estimate. Remember, the point estimate's a sample statistic, so it makes sense that they're going to be in the middle. And if you look at the leftmost bar, okay, it crosses the parameter. So in other words, this interval contains the parameter. It has to be below the point estimate. No big deal. We have the second one here. You'll notice that the, the parameter is above the point estimate, okay? But the point is 95 out of the 100 contain the parameter. So if we had, let's say, 85% confidence, what we would be expecting is to see 15 red bars, in other words, uh, 15 that don't contain the parameter, and 85 that do. So just a visual representation uh, of a 95% confidence interval. All right, um, we have some formulas that return. Um, so some of this is review, especially the notation and the statistic uh, and the population standard deviation, um, et cetera, okay? And we remember the sampling distribution of standard deviations, specifically sigma over root n. I hope that's familiar to you. Um, but carefully about the proportion, we've made a change. Do you notice how it's in the square root? It's p hat times one minus p hat over n, it's not p anymore. We're gonna to return to why that is the case. Um, so again, this is all familiar to us. We know how to compute x bar, that's an average uh, specifically for the sample. We know how to build p hot x over n, x being whatever it is we're studying over n being the total in the uh, sample, okay? All right, so how do we build confidence intervals? Uh, well, we need three things. First of all, you need a point estimate. Okay, remember that's coming from the sample. So it's either a sample proportion or a sample mean. We need something called the margin of error. So that's something we have to compute. And then we need a level of confidence. Okay, and then we're able to put all of this together uh, and build our confidence interval. So you need all of them. Now the margin of error uh, or always called the maximum error of estimate E. This is the largest possible distance from the point estimate that a confidence interval will cover. So this essentially is, is, um, is sort of defining the range of values. So how wide is my interval going to be? Well, the margin of error will dictate that. So for example, um, if I think that the true average final exam score is 75, and I'm using that as my point estimate, and my margin of error is five, okay, five points, then what I do is I take the point estimate and I add five and subtract five, because five is what I'm saying is the margin of error. So that's how I would get then from um, uh, 70 to 80, if it's 75, uh, adding five and subtracting five, okay? If I said the point estimate was 82, um, then we would add five, that would be 87, and subtracting um, five, we would have uh, 70, 77. Okay, so that defines then the, the interval. Now, the level of confidence, um, that again is the percentage that is given to us, like 95%, et cetera. Um, and so the idea is, well, okay, what do we do with this? What, what exactly does this sort of thing tell us? Well, there's gonna be a table of values that we're gonna have to use that relies on uh, the normal distribution, okay? And you might remember the z-score from chapter seven and chapter six, but it's not as complicated as that. So at the picture on the right, um, you should notice that we have C is equal to 0.95. So if I said to you, I'm interested in a 95% confidence uh, interval, when I say 95%, I'm really defining the area that is in the middle of the curve. So that's why it says C is equal to 0.95. Now the question is, what's left underneath the curve, okay? If we take 
one minus C, C is 0.95, we end up with 0.05, okay? But the problem is we need the area that's in both tails. So this is kind of like a little bit of section 6.4 coming back, if you remember. So how do I get then the area that's in both tails? Well, we take one minus 0.95, we get 0 0.05. And then what I have to do is I have to divide that area by two. So alpha here is literally one minus C. So alpha is 0 0.05, but I have to divide that by two. So dividing 0 0.05 by two, you get 0 0.025. That's the area in both tails. So you go to the normal distribution table and we look up 0 0.025. That's going to give you a Z value of negative 1.96. And so that also means on the other tail, it has to be positive 1.96. So that's where the derivation of this value, of these values are going to come from. And we actually have a chart, we can get there, there it is, that tells us this. So if you look for 95, okay, as a level of confidence, 0.95, the area that's left is 0 0.05, and the Z that's going to give us this is the 1.96. And you notice that there's another C of values here, 1.28, 1.44, etc. These are all values that have been derived for us to make our lives easier using the strategy that I just showed on the previous slide. Okay. Now, you'll notice that the level of confidence that's represented here, 80, 85, 90, 95, 98, 99, these are the only percentages that you will be asked to use. However, you do know now how to derive them. So if I asked you what would be the Z alpha over two value for 82%, you could figure it out, okay, using some of the techniques that we just discussed that actually come from section 6.4. This chart is provided for you um, on the formula sheet, so there's no need to memorize it uh, or, you know, uh, some other means, so it's not necessary. Now, um, one of the questions that we will ask you is to interpret um, what we mean by something like 85% confidence. And if you remember back on the drawing, um, the picture that I showed you of the 95% confidence interval that had all the red lines on it, um, what the interpretation would be is that if we take 100 samples, we expect, and you insert whatever the confidence level is. So if it's 98%, we would say if we take 100 samples, we expect 98 of the samples to contain the parameter. So you just insert whatever the, the confidence level is uh, in where that blank spot is. Uh, and so this is known as interpreting the confidence uh, level, okay? And so you may have to do that um, on an exam for me, uh, make sure that we understand really what's what it's being uh, uh, told to us. Now, these are the formulas that we use for the margin of error. Um, and so the reason we needed to talk about Z alpha over two is because you'll notice that in both formulas for the margin of error, um, Z alpha over two is used, okay? So for means, we take the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, namely sigma over root n, and you multiply by Z alpha over two, and the same thing on the side of the proportions. Now, you'll notice again that we are using p hat in the formula, okay, for underneath that square root. And I have the question posed here, why are we using p hat instead of p? And the answer to that is very simple, and that is that we have no idea what p is. So we're estimating it. So that's why we're using p hat, okay? So in this section, we have no clue what it is. Therefore, we have to use p hat. Now, if we put everything together um, for means, we have the point estimate that we use. That's going to be whatever X bar is, the sample mean that's reported. Margin of error formula is there. And then to build the confidence interval, once again, we take the point estimate and you add and subtract the margin of error. And that defines what the interval is. And the same thing on the side with the proportions. We use P hat. Uh, the sample proportion is the point estimate margin of error formula again, and for the confidence interval, we take p hat and we add and subtract the margin of error. Now, um, the other thing I talked about us having to do is to build a confidence statement, okay? So um, we did this a, a couple of slides ago. Um, I believe it was with the um, uh, voting, 30% to 40%, uh, et cetera. I was think it was a 75% confidence interval. So if in the instructions, on the homework or the exam or the final, it says to write a confidence statement or it says 
interpret the confidence uh, level, or excuse me, interpret the confidence interval. Uh, so it either say write a confidence statement or interpret the confidence interval. What it's asking you to do are the same thing. So writing a confidence statement. So what we how it begins is we are blank percent confident that the true mean or proportion of, and you insert a context, um, is between, and you provide the units um, that are that are given um, if it's a mean. If it's a proportion, then it'll be listed as a percentage or a decimal, and, and units are not necessary. Okay, so simply inserting the percentage, uh, again, whether it's a mean or proportion within context, and then you describe what the interval is. So a very simple sort of statement uh, in terms of its structure. All right, we also have um, one other application in these two set of sections, and that is forming a minimum sample size. So often um, researchers will want to try to get ahead of not creating confidence intervals that are so large. In other words, they're very wide. Um, they wanna try to maybe minimize that as much as possible. And so would they do that by saying, okay, I want a certain level of confidence, uh, the Z alpha over two value. I know what the population standard deviation is gonna be. Um, and I want a specific margin of error. Okay, so what kind of sample do I need to put together in order to have these sort of conditions hold? And so that's what the formula allows us to do. Now you'll notice in the formula for the proportions, in this instance, we have to know what E is, okay? And it's just the nature of how the formula is put together. Um, but it's an interesting application that allows us to sort of choose um, our sample size. And we'll do an example of this so that you can see how these formulas get used. It is important to note that if either one of these formulas gives us a decimal value, we need to round it up, okay? So even something like, uh, I don't know, 307.02, we have to round that up to 308, okay? So make sure you pay attention to that. Any decimal, we need to round up to the next larger uh, whole number, because obviously we can't have a fraction of an individual. All right, so conceptual things, make sure you're able to write a confidence statement. We talked about that a moment ago. Um, interpret the level of confidence. That's uh, if we have 100 samples, we expect blank to contain the uh, parameter. Um, and then three and four, we need to understand what happens if we play with the confidence uh, interval. In other words, we we alter the level of confidence. What, what, what happens? What's the implication? And then also um, in number four, how do we narrow the confidence interval without changing the level of confidence? So these are three, three and four are very important conceptual pieces, which we'll explore uh, in the examples that we're going to look at. All right. So once again, please pause this uh, and give it a read. All right. Um, we want to know um, which are the correct interpretation of the confidence level and which is the interpretation of the confidence interval. So part A says, we are confident that the true mean admission rate is between 52.8% and 75%. So this has to be an interpretation of what the confidence interval means because we are listing the interval. So if we are writing a confidence statement, what that means is we are interpreting the confidence interval. So that's what this one is doing. The only thing I would suggest that they need to include is the confidence level. So it should say we are 95% confident. That would make this uh, a little bit more meaningful. We, however, do have the context uh, coming from the problem. Part B says, in about 95% of all samples of 10 colleges, the confidence interval will contain the population mean admission rate. Okay, so now this is talking about what 95% is meaning. Okay, so if we take 100 samples, 95 are going to contain the parameter. That's what this is saying. So that's an interpretation of the confidence level. So now you see the difference between how do we interpret a confidence interval, how do we interpret a confidence level. All right, so in this instance, we have um, two different confidence intervals. Okay, so this is GPA. So one is from 2.6 to 3.2 and another 2.65 to 3.15. Now it says one of them's a 95% confidence interval and the other is 90%, which is which and how do we know? So this really is an excellent question. Um, so what would be different, okay? 
if you look carefully um, at that normal table uh, that I gave you a few minutes ago that had the different levels of confidence, you'll notice that for 95%, um, that value would be 1.96. And for 90%, that would be 1.645. So there's a difference in that, we call this the, the critical value, the Z alpha over two. Now, the 1.96 um, value means that our interval would be larger, right? And that kind of makes sense that it would contain more samples anyway, being a 95% versus 90%. Again, if we took 100 samples, 95 contain the parameter versus 90 containing the parameter. So 95% has more samples. So the bigger interval has to be the 95% confidence and the smaller interval has to be the 90% confidence, okay? So two reasons why. Number one, that Z alpha over two value is larger for 95%, so it's a bigger number we're multiplying by, okay? Makes the margin of error larger. And for looking at the interpretation of these two values, 95% means if we take 100 samples, 95 contain the parameter. If we take 100 samples, 90 contain the parameter. Well, 95 is obviously bigger, has to be a larger interval. Herb B is asking if we use a larger sample size, um, let's say 120 versus 30, what's going to happen to the 95% confidence interval? Is this wider or narrower than the one reported here? Another great question. So we have the sigma over root n, and we clearly see that n is in the denominator, okay, as the sample size. So um, let's try a simple example and try to illustrate this. So pretend that sigma is 3.4, and let's compare for different values of n. So if n is 120, okay, this margin of, uh, excuse me, this, this, yeah, part of margin of error would be 0 0.310, okay? And look what happens for a million. It's 0 0.0034. So what happens when we increase that sample size? Well, that margin of error gets very small. You might say, Rich, you have to multiply by the Z alpha over two. I understand that. We're just looking at the, the sigma over root n piece for now, okay? Multiplying by the Z alpha over two value is still gonna result in small number. So with the idea here, very important conceptual piece is that if we increase the sample size, the margin of error is going to get smaller. And what this does then is it narrows the confidence interval. So those conceptual questions that I had on the previous slide, number three, that was answered in part A, and number four is answered here in part B. So if somebody asks you or tells you my confidence interval, I don't like how wide it is, but I don't wanna change the level of confidence, what can I do? you say increase the sample size, okay? Why does increasing the sample size make the interval more narrow? Very simple reason, it reduces variation. You may recall me saying this over and over the semester, how do we reduce variation? We increase the sample size. All right, this example, um, you go ahead and pause and, and give it a read. Okay, so what we're looking for here is to actually build an 80% confidence interval um, for the mean weight um, of all bags of oranges. So this is about means, clearly says uh, uh, mean in the question. And we need to use then the X bar plus or minus Z alpha over two uh, times the sigma over, and I should say root N, not Z. Okay, so that Z of the denominator should be uh, in N. All right, so the point estimate here was 10.3, uh, and that is the average that they found from the sample. Okay, so we accept that as our point estimate. Um, the 1.28 is the Z alpha over two value. We'll return to that in a minute. Standard deviation was 0.3, and we divide by our sample size, um, which they gave us, uh, which was 50 in the opening sentence. Okay, so we have 10.3 plus or minus um, 0.0543. And what we do then with that 0 0.0543, which is the margin of error, is you add and subtract that to the 10.3. And we're just rounding this to two decimal places to keep it clean. We get 10 and a quarter pounds uh, to 10 and 35 hundredths pounds. So that, again, defines our confidence uh, interval. And if we write a confidence statement, if we interpret what this interval says, it says we are 80% confident 
that the true average weight of all bags of oranges is between 10.25 pounds and 10.35 pounds. So again, true average means the proportion, okay, the proportion. Um, so again, that point estimate is 10.3 pounds, okay, and the margin of error here is the 0 0.0543 pounds. So again, letting you know what the vocabulary is, because in a question on an exam or final or homework, I could ask you, what is the point estimate here? Okay, and you're going to be able to tell me without any hesitation, it's 10.3. That's the sample mean. What's the margin of error? We have to compute it, okay? Um, and again, just to show you, the 80%. Okay, locks us into this particular row. There's our 80 and our 0 0.80 uh, as, a, as a decimal, and that value all the way to the right is 1.28. So I'm not going to show you this chart again, uh, just so you know where I'm pulling the critical value here, the Z alpha over to uh, for each of these uh, examples. All right, once again, please uh, take a moment and pause the, the video and give this one a read. All right, so once again, we're looking to build a confidence interval, this one 90%, uh, and this problem is dealing with averages because it says average, okay? So there's our formula again. Uh, good grief, make sure the denominator square root of N, not Z, all right? Uh, let's see, we've got a point estimate here, which was 450, okay? And that's because they took a sample and found the average weight, all right? Um, our critical value, the Z alpha over two for 90%, that's 1.645. Um, the zebra weights are 15 kilograms, so 15 should be in the numerator. There it is. And our sample size here is 300. So 450, again, is our point estimate, and the margin of error is 1.4246. So we add and subtract that from the um, point estimate, and we end up with a confidence interval here that ranges from 448.58 kilograms to 451.42 kilograms. So it is our hope that the true weight, okay, the true average weight of zebras is in our interval. And we have a 90% chance uh, of being correct. So we are, uh, as a confidence statement, we are 90% confident that the true average weight of all zebras is between 448.58 kilograms and 451.42 kilograms. Okay, once again, give this one a pause uh, and take a look. All right, so again, we're looking to build a 90% confidence uh, interval, but this one is dealing with proportions, okay? So change in the formula. So we're using the P hat plus or minus Z alpha over two, and then uh, everyone's favorite uh, square root expression. All right, so what we have to do then is to actually figure out what exactly is P hat. Okay, so they don't come right out and tell us. However, they do tell us that there was a survey um, and the survey had a result. Okay, and that result was 820 out of the 1,025 students thinking that there's not enough parking on campus. So that's why we're using that value 820 over 1025 or 0 0.8 as the point estimate here. Okay. Um, Z alpha over two is the same as the last problem, 1.645. Um, and then you'll notice in the square root, um, we have 0 0.8, okay, since we're using the parameter or the sample proportion, one minus 0 0.8 divided by the total sample size of 1,025. It's very easy to make an error in terms of uh, substituting the value. So do take your time with that. And this computation is a bit more complicated than the previous example because of the square root. So do take your time when you're plugging in the numbers into your calculator. Okay, so I, I simplified the root for us so you can see what those values are if you're working this, um, this problem with me. Uh, so what we end up with, again, is a point estimate of 0.8. Um, and then the margin of error here is 0 0.0200. Five, five. So adding and subtracting that to the margin of error, we get 0.779 uh, to 0.821. So some people leave the um, uh, values as decimals. You don't have to. Um, sometimes it makes more sense to convert them to a percentage, especially when we're writing the confidence statement, as you now see on the screen. Um, so the confidence statement would say we are 90% confident that the true proportion of Wayne State students who think there is not enough parking on campus is between 77.9% and 82.1%. Okay, so um, that's what the, the confidence, um, interpretation of the confidence interval would be here. 
Okay. And again, to remind us, just to make sure the vocabulary is fresh, uh, point estimate is 80%, and the margin of error here is the 0 0.02055. So do make sure you, you know the various components of, uh, of these values. Okay, once again, uh, give this one a read. All right, if you read this one carefully, um, the question here was how large a sample would we need? Okay, so this is our minimum sample size question. Okay, and we're using this in the context of proportions. Uh, we know that because it says that word right in the first sentence. Okay, um, so this means that we're using this formula, the n equals p times 1 minus p uh, multiplied by z alpha over 2 divided by the margin of error, and that quantity is squared. So now it's just a matter of extracting um, all the necessary information. So 0.21 um, is what we use as our parameter here, because it says the commissioner of education believes that the proportion is around 0.21, so there it is. Um, for 85%, the Z alpha over 2 value is 1.44, and they told us that the error here was 0 0.03. So that is the value that we are using. So simplifying 0 0.21 times 1 minus 0 0.21 results in that 0 0.131061 value. And then simplifying the fraction, 1.44 uh, divided by 0 0.03 gives us 48. We square that and multiply, and we end up with 301.96. And I remember my explanation that you have to round up uh, when we have a, a uh, decimal. Uh, so that would be 302. So this would be the minimum sample size that we would need to take for this particular sample for an 85% confidence level and an error that is at most 0 0.03. So that would give us this. Now you might say, well, well, what happens if we change the level of confidence? Well, that then is going to have an implication on your sample size. The sample size will change. Okay. Uh, if, we, if you say, well, I want to alter the margin of error here to be something else, well, that's going to change then the sample size. So you can play with that to see uh, how that would impact then the, the minimum sample size that we need. But there are implications to that. Okay, and again, it's always round up for the minimum sample size questions. All right, um, I believe there's a question that, you, that pops up in the online homework um, that has you kind of work things a little bit in reverse. So in other words, it gives you a confidence interval and it says, hey, can you tell us what the margin of error is? Okay, so for example, let's suppose that the confidence interval is something like 32.14 units uh, to 44.61 units. And units can stand for anything you want, feet, pounds, uh, uh, whatever, kilograms, okay, whatever, whatever context you want. All right, so what can we do? Um, well, to find the margin of error, we have to find the difference between the two endpoints, okay? So first thing we do then is subtract them, okay? And what we end up with is 12.47, okay? So that again is the difference. Now divide that by two, okay? And what you should end up with is 6.235, and that then is your margin of error, okay? So it's almost like finding the midpoint, okay? Which is essentially what would, uh, similar process as that. So you can also find um, the point estimate by adding this value to the lower endpoint, okay? So 32.14 plus this margin of error, um, or you can subtract it from the higher endpoint. And what that would end up giving us is 38.375. So 38.375 um, is smack dab right in the middle um, of that interval, okay? And so that then would be considered the point estimate. So that literally would be the midpoint, but so much similar process um, for finding the margin of error. So um, if you find that in the online homework uh, where it's asking you to find the margin of error when it gives you a, a confidence interval, um, now you know how to do that. All right, so as a recap um, for this video, uh, lots of vocabulary. Definitely make sure you're able to define a point estimate. Okay, again, it's a single number estimate for our uh, population parameter, and it takes on one of two forms. It's either, at least in this sec uh, set of sections, a sample um, proportion or a sample mean. Um, given a scenario, be able to say what the point estimate is in the problem. Okay, so that's important. Um, we've done some building with confidence intervals. You've done some examples with means and proportions. We've wrote several confidence statements. We did some interpretation with the confidence level. We talked about the impact um, 
that playing with the level of confidence has on the confidence interval, as well as the sample size. What do we do? How do I, what, what does raising the sample size do to the confidence interval? You remember that it decreases the width of the interval. Uh, and then we more recently worked on some uh, minimum sample size examples, uh, which was the more recent ones that we looked at. All right, that concludes chapter eight.